November began the next morning. When I rose at seven, sunlight incised through both central room entrances and illuminated the dull gray floor of baked mud. Maria had removed the basin of chichiquili tamales from the fires, for they had cooked enough. Now that yesterday had been dedicated to all of the deceased, the first of November was to feast with the infants and children. Much of Central and South Mexico joined in the occasion, for their cities observed it on the first and second of the month. The elderly couple was duly animated this morning as they prepared their food offerings for the main altar. Jose played an audio cassette of the Wapango string trio Rey Ixtla, singing in Nahuatl for an indigenous wedding. He and Maria brought elaborate installments of foods, veritable meals, to the altar. Cups of chocolate, bottles of soda, moral bags with soda bottles, and seven variously sized baskets of fruit and chichiquili rested upon or around two rows of banana leaves on the floor, running perpendicular to and in front of the altar table. A parallel pair of long sugarcane stalks flanked the central row of banana leaves. One of the newer baskets, variegated in its bands of pink, tan, and beige, contained three small buns of pan de muerto. Two of the buns resembled small corpses with crossed legs, mementos of death and starch. A white handkerchief embroidered in garish blossoms of slender flowers draped the breads. Beeswax candles effortlessly burned in a small green horsey candle holder at the rims of the shorter baskets or molten upon the floor. Jose and Maria waved the lit censer over the offerings and toward the altar, and sprinkled water upon them with blossom of marigold flower and sprig of tlachpoastli bush. Droplets of water adhered to the sprig's small, waxy, circular leaves. Even though the food offerings were devoted to the spirits of the deceased, and for today specifically those of children, the soul bodies weren't physically consuming or reducing any of the food substance. As for the essence of the food, the souls were drawing some sort of ethereal quality from them, one that took a bit of its taste. Of course, as so much food had been prepared for these animistic feasts, no Nawa would be so insouciant as to waste it. A mundane practicality tempers the most steadfast of spiritual thinking here. As the spirits were partaking of the foods around the altar, Maria served me a cup of chocolate with my breakfast of two hot titiquili and two pansy buns. The overnight fire had given the square tamales a firm, roasted character, saturated with the leafy bleed of the pahpatla wrapping and the subtle lines of the tomato sauce. It hinted of green leaves and red pepper, dark pork and rustic maize. The entire field tasted in each bite. Jose and Maria prepared the chantolo meals. Pods of large, bold huactili pepper were boiling in a small pot over the hearth fire. Maria emptied several of the baskets at the altar space and hung them in the kitchen, and then she began retiring cups and plates from the central room. Outside, Jose slaughtered a rooster that he brought to the kitchen, set on the floor, and began to pluck. He washed it with an all-purpose soap, hacked it into pieces with a machete, and placed the chunks from limbs to organs to head in a small plastic tub. The rooster was boiled in a glazed clay bowl for tomorrow's meals. Half of its broth was reserved for the animatsitsi, the little spirits, honored during this time. At the turn of noon, Jose called me to listen to the dissonant fireworks sounding in the western distance, so many that they sounded like thunder. He left for the milpa for an hour, and he returned with several stalks of sugarcane, each between four and five feet long and about an inch thick. He stood for against the poles framing the central room altar, their long sturdy leaves fanned from the raised ends and folded under the ceiling. With long strips of quajmecat bark, Jose tied two other stalks to the small palo mulato cross at the table on the porch. He then took respite in his hammock, shaded beneath the pavilion. I followed to ask about the sugar cane. The canes at the altars are for the animatsitsi to take to their domiciles, Jose explained through a relaxed smile. Although animatsitsi was borrowed from Spanish, it matched with indigenous beliefs in the afterlife, but only to an extent. The anima spirits here live in barrio neighborhoods. Barrios? What kinds of barrios? Here? I asked, raising the question as if it were a jigsaw puzzle piece that I knew where to lay by looking at the cover design, even when I had nothing else to link with it. The barrios are here, around the neighborhood, and the animatsitsi go about the community just as we do. Here on earth, or are they in heaven? If on earth, then the afterlife designation was indigenous, for the spirits dwelt about the surface and in the vast realms of the underworld beneath. If in heaven, then the afterlife was European in its import. They're around here on earth. As for heaven, only our father Totata and our mother Tonana dwell there. Aside from them, who knows? 
More pieces now fitted together. Jose was referencing the duality, the highest abstraction and most essential form of divinity of the Mesoamerican cosmos. The Aztecs called it Ometeot, the two deity, the pairing of two lord and two lady in the celestial heights. The sugarcane originated in India. The chickens and breads came from Europe. The banana and citrus fruits were Southeast Asian. Jose's observance of the Days of the Dead included a scope of foreign foods and terms but the gods and souls remained incontrovertibly Aztec. For more experiences and lessons from living in the Aztec and Otomi villages of Veracruz, please visit shamanscross.com, the website for my memoir. I pinned the link in the comments. Thank you for watching, happy Days of the Dead, and good roads.